Short answer, they blow in opposite directions. Westerlies are prevailing winds that blow from west to east, while trade winds, also known as easterlies, blow from east to west. Additionally, they have opposite axial directions as trade winds go toward the equator, while the westerlies are poleward. Thus, they inhabit different latitudes. They are divided by the horse latitudes of around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. The trade winds prevail between these and the equator, while the westerlies dominate poleward outside of these. The prevalence of these winds dominate on the open ocean, with the continents causing severe turbulence in their prevalence and causing the winds to bend off along the coasts. The only place where you can find the prevailing winds unobstructed by land is around Antarctica in the screaming 60s, where the winds go all around the earth. The trade winds and westerlies are emitted from the horse latitudes, where the air that rises at the equator comes back down, forming two high-pressure belts around the earth. The trade winds are dragged in towards the equator by the pressure differential caused by all the air rising at the equator, while the westerlies are pushed poleward by the high pressure at the horse latitudes moving towards the lower pressure of the poles. This would lead to the winds going straight north or south if not for the rotation of the earth. Because the earth spins on its axis, it has a great difference in rotational momentum between the equator and the poles. The equator simply needs to cover a much longer distance each day and thus moves faster. The trade winds thus goes opposite the spin of the earth because they have less momentum at the horse latitudes than the earth has at the equator. The westerlies on the other hand has more momentum at the horse latitudes than the higher latitudes and thus gains on the earth's spin as they move, causing them to go eastwards. This is the same for both the northern and southern hemisphere, but because north and south of the equator are mirror images, the trade winds and westerlies end up going clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern, simply due to their position relative to each other. This is the cause of the Coriolis effect of large-scale structures rotating clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. It is not a rotation in the winds in the strictest sense, but due to the land masses blocking the wind, making them curve, it gets the shape of a rotation around the horizontal axis of the horse latitudes. This creates a real rotation in the wind-driven surface currents of the oceans in the form of the great oceanic gyres that thus ends up rotating as the wind patterns dictate. Even as the winds do not continuously cross the horse latitudes as they do not fully rotate, the currents do rotate from the momentum imparted by the winds. This was extremely important to sailing ships as this meant that they could cross the often windless horse latitudes by simply riding along on the currents. Thus they could cross from the areas dominated by the westerlies to the regions of the trade winds and thus you can go from Europe to America in a great circle with the wind from stern almost the entire way. Even at the equator where the windless doldrums prevail, the counter currents formed by the rotating currents north and south of the equator allow for the riding of currents across it. It was the Portuguese who first fully came to map these wind patterns and currents, as well as develop shipbuilding far enough to take advantage of them in an effort to connect Europe to Asia around Africa. The greatest problem they faced with their route was that when crossing to the Indian Ocean, they would be met with the Indian Oceanic Gaia, whose currents and winds were against them. They thus had to cross and beat against the currents and winds to go up the eastern coast of Africa. For this they had good use of the developments they had made in shipbuilding and sail rigging, as this made their ships highly maneuverable for the time. The Dutch later fully circumvented the problem of the winds and currents of East Africa by using the Brewer route, where they used the westerlies and currents of the southern section of the Indian Oceanic Gaia to go across the southern section of the Indian Ocean and up to Indonesia.
It was a dangerous strategy as they risked shipwrecking in Western Australia, but it was fast and efficient. The problem with the winds and currents of southeastern Africa also makes it obvious why Christopher Columbus's plan to reach Asia across the Atlantic made sense. If you could take the trade winds out and the westerlies back home, it would be much faster and easier than going around Africa. Unfortunately for Columbus, America and the Pacific was in between, but the route works for Europe and America. The patterns of the winds and currents are also the reason that the sailing routes of the age of sails often looked like taking the long way round. It was simply because they took the route that the knowledge of the winds and currents permitted. Thus, with proper knowledge of the wind patterns and the related currents, it became possible to sail all around the world ocean with the winds at your back rather than against you. Here, proper knowledge of the trade winds and the westerlies was at the very center, as these are the main major wind systems of the world and the main driver of the surface currents and the great oceanic gyres. Thus, the trade winds and westerlies are the opposing winds that drive the oceanic surface current system and make world oceanic sailing with sailing ships possible. Also, the rotation-like motion of the trade winds and the westerlies around the horse latitudes, along with the dependent currents that form the oceanic gyres, also form oceanic zones inside the gyres with little wind or current, where the oceans are still enough that potential permanent floating structures could be placed there.